very, very great pleasure to welcome Carl Austin Hyatt to our Lake Erie Institute EcoX series of interesting people. <laughs> uh, Carl is a photographer and a world traveler, and he's going to tell us his story through his photographs. And I apologize for the background noise where I'm at. So, Carl, I'm going to let you start talking. I'm going to share the screen here. Okay. Um, I live on the uh, coast of New Hampshire, and I have been a photographer for uh, 50 years this summer. And I guess I will tell the story about how I became a photographer. When I was in college, I wanted to be a writer. I was very inspired by Thoreau and Emerson and Blake and Wordsworth. Uh, but I was a lousy writer. And uh, when I got out of college, uh, I, I did know that uh, I had a certain talent for photography. Uh, it just came naturally. And because it came naturally, um, I didn't give it any great import. Writing was difficult, so that was profound and important. Um, that first summer in 1971 out of college, um, I joined a uh, friend who was in a hippie community at the time. And uh, my father, who was a East Coast uh, New England businessman was of course completely horrified by this. He had been a photographer in the Second World War. And uh, so he had an appreciation for photography. And to save me from the clutches of uh, hippiedom, he signed me up in an Ansel Adams photography workshop out in Yosemite. So uh, I went to this workshop. Ansel was uh, just such a wonderful, um, almost a Santa Claus type of teacher. Very generous, very present, um, and uh, full of information. Uh, all of that information basically went over my head because I was so green. I could develop some film and I could make some mediocre prints, but that was about it. It was about making a photographic book. And when they asked for volunteers to volunteer in the dark room uh, to process the film that people were going to be making and to make position prints for this mock-up of a book that we were going to do over the two weeks, I volunteered which ended up being great because in the evening, Ansel would come in and say, uh, guys, you've put in a good day's work. When you clean up in here, come on over the house for drinks. He had some very famous other teachers there. I was way too young to be impressed by Ansel uh, or the other people. Beaumont and Nancy Newhall, who founded the photography department at the Museum of Modern Art. Uh, everybody was very wonderful. Um, at the end, uh, Ansel asked what, uh, what he could do for me at the end of the workshop, and I asked him to sit for a portrait. I'm not sure if that portrait's in this selection, but in any case, uh, that was a very meaningful experience. But the most profound thing that happened was a couple of days later, as I was driving back across the country, uh, early one morning, I was driving through a not a dramatic valley in Colorado, just a beautiful valley. And as I came around the curve, this feeling came over me that I just started to follow. So I pulled the car over to the side of the road and got out. And I remember very clearly seeing the tumbleweed blowing across the road. And as I looked out at the valley, I was very aware that, the, that nature was conscious, that nature was alive, that I was in relationship with that. It wasn't out there, it was like all inclusive. It was one of those timeless moments. And at the same moment, I don't know how to describe this, I knew I was a photographer. Not only that, yeah. I knew I had really a mission. I don't know any other way to say it, other than I felt like 
I had a, I had a colon and it just came in. It all came in as a piece that nature was alive, that I was a photographer and that I needed to get to work. And so my photography is about interacting with that, what I call the soul of the world or what Plato called the anima mundi. Uh, there's a beautiful article about the Anima Mundi um, by Llewellyn Vaughn Lee, the Sufi mystic and writer. I, you, you can Google that, it'll come right up. It's at the Golden Sufi Center or something like that. It goes into it in quite a lot of beautiful detail. Um, and I would say that that soul of the world is what is moving through the Romantic poets. Um, and, and through a great deal of art, at least the art that I'm interested in, which is art that transmits that soul of the world. And that could be a painting, it could be a sculpture, it could be writing, um, hopefully it's a photograph. Um, yeah, and particularly, uh, the part of nature that speaks to me in that way most incessantly is stones and rocks uh, of all forms. So you can see a picture there of the stones in my studio that I've collected over time. And for me, they are like, I don't know, God's gesture, God's sculpture. It's not... In the indigenous world, the shape of a stone is telling you what about itself. The shape of a mountain is telling you about itself. Mm -hmm. I will digress a little bit. When I was, uh, my parents took us to uh, Europe for a big family trip at the end of, uh, end of my college years. And I was with my brother and we were walking around the Rijksmuseum. And at this time, I was not a committed artist. I was not a photographer. I was just, you know, taking in life. I was a 19 year old kid guy taking in life. And I walked into a little room which no longer exists in the Rijksmuseum because they've redone it. But in this little room, like a passageway between two bigger rooms was a self portrait of Rembrandt. I walked into that little room, I looked at that portrait and just like in the valley, Rembrandt reached out and grabbed me by the collar and started talking to me. Not like I heard a voice in my head. I didn't hear a voice when I was standing in the valley, but all of a sudden there was like this tractor beam of energy that was for me. And it was one of those late self portraits they're not happy. Um, he's already gone bankrupt. He's already in disrepute in a number of ways. And he just downloaded Rembrandt. And I had no idea that a 400 year old painting or any work of art could do that. So when I did become a photographer, that moment, long moment, it was at least 15 minutes with Rembrandt, um, marked a lot of my work and the amount of soul that can be invested in a face, a portrait, any work of art. Um, so Rembrandt has also completely marked me. All right. So I photographed on the coast of New Hampshire for a good 15 years and started having a deep, profound relationship with the, with the land. I would have synchronicities, I would have dreams. Uh, I knew the land was speaking to me. I knew that I was destined to be in this place. And that in fact, the, the land had called me. I was, I'm quite aware that the land called me. And I'm also quite aware that that land also sent me to Peru. Um, 
but while I was doing this, I was reading a lot of shamanic books because it's only in the shamanic view of the world, not in our Western view of the world, that these kinds of sensations make any sense. I mean, in our Western logical, rational, uh, scientific, uh, provable, repeatable truth, um, yeah, this kind of stuff does not get a lot of traction. In fact, it's, it's I would say, very definitely um, discouraged and um, disrespected. Uh, it's great if you can turn it into making a million dollars or being a famous artist, but other than that, you know, we're, we're, we're not interested in your intuitions. Mm. One day, uh, walking around my little town of Portsmouth, I ran into a woman who was showing some snapshots. And I, I barely knew this woman, but I kind of knew her. And she said, oh, Carl, come on over, take a look at these pictures. And they were pictures very similar to what you're about to see uh, in Peru. And she was, I looked at these pictures and they were people in colorful ponchos in the mountains and she hadn't said anything yet. And I looked at her and I said, these are shamans, right? She goes, yes, they're shamans. And I just got back from Peru and we were initiated at 15,000 feet and they work with stones. And I just went, okay. Uh, and her teacher was giving a workshop down in Providence in two weeks. I took that workshop and I knew, and I loved the teachings. It's like everything made, all of a sudden, all of my vague intuitions and my promptings suddenly made sense on some level or started to make sense. And then I determined that I have to go visit this tribe uh, which are called the Caddo Indians. And they live between 13 and 16,000 feet um, in Peru. This was the spring of 98. Uh, it was a, I, I've written about this. Maybe we can put it in the chat or something. I've just written an article about all of this for the first time. Um, it was an arduous trip by horseback through a snowstorm I was not acclimated to the altitude. It was incredibly painful. Uh, but when I woke up the next morning, here was this village from the 15th century. Thatched roofs, stone huts, dirt floors, and a tradition uh, that was way older than the Incas. I mean, they are called, they are often called the last of the Incas but these traditions go way beyond the Incas. The Incas were only like the 1400s. Think of it as the 1400s. And then the conquistadors came in in the like 1530s. I'll give you a time frame. So every shamanic culture uh, is interacting with, is forming relationships with their environment. That's their world. They see the world and the whole cosmos as conscious, as alive, as aware, as responsive, as really a partnership. We're constantly, consciously or unconsciously, in an intimate partnership with the whole cosmos, and specifically with mm -hmm. what they would say, Pachamama, the Mother Earth. Mm -hmm. So if you're a shaman or you're... Uh, culture living down in the jungle, all your wisdom is about the plants. I mean, not all of it, but it's about plants. It's about the Amazon. But if you're up in the mountains, just take a look at this picture. It's uh, rocks, stones, stars, and mountains. Mm -hmm. So they know, and they've been doing this for eons most profound moment of that trip for me, really the whole point of the trip, happened that first morning. I was sitting alone out on the landscape uh, and there was a little river that flowed through the village and it was very quiet, pristine, calm, oh, up in the mountains. 
And all of a sudden I felt this little tug in my gut that there was a stone for me. And I, I recognized that tug because I'd had it a lot of times on the coast of New Hampshire. I didn't really know what it meant, but I knew to follow that tug. So I slowly walked over to the side of the stream and I looked down and of course the, there, there are 5,000 stones there, but I see immediately the stone that's calling to me. I pick it up, not with a lot of confidence. I don't have a lot of confidence at this point. I'm, I'm so green. And I bring it to this meeting uh, with Puma and the three elders and the rest of us that were on that trip. And when we had a break, I gave it to Puma and I said, could you, uh, could you ask the, the elders what they think of this stone? Is it a good stone? Is it a good stone for your mesa? So they have a, a tradition of a mesa. The mesa is a collection of stones that is really a portable altar. And those stones are maybe given to you by one of your shamanic teachers or they're from a sacred mountain, or they're from a sacred lagoon. Um, and they are a bridge, a portal to the wisdom and the power that is in that mountain or that teacher or that lagoon. So you have in your bundle, like sitting at your computer, you click on that stone and that, that world opens to you is one way of saying it. So they take the stone and the three of them just jump in on it and they all have an opinion. They're like, rrr, rrr, rrr. they're all, and they're pointing to this and they're pointing to that and they're talking to each other and they're trading it back and forth. And finally the uh, elder in the center there looks up and uh, Puma starts to translate. And he says, well, it's a very good kuya. A kuya is their term for one of these stones, and it comes from the verb kuyaiki, which means to care for, to care deeply for. So your way into your stones or a mountain or the ocean is through your heart. Your heart is a perceptual organ in a way that Western science doesn't think of the heart, although it start, all of this stuff is now, everything I'm talking about, is starting to be proved out by Western science, but we'll get there hopefully. So you access that stone through your heart and your awareness, obviously your presence. So he says to me, uh, well, it's a very good kuya. It's in the shape of a triangle. It's a condor stone. And because it's in the shape of a triangle, you put it, take all of your other stones, move them out to the edges of your mesa, put this in the center, and then bring your other stones around it. This stone is very good for distributing energy. And I go, great, but how do I work with it? And of course he says, you take all of your other stones, you push them out to the edge, you put this one in the center. It's really good for distributing energies. Bring your so he and I do this for a little bit. And then finally I say again, but how do I work with it? And he looks at me, I'll never forget that look and his gesture pointing to the stone. And he says, you believe in it without doubt. Aman hakak ishkayan kichu ini nikita. That was like a haiku. That was like just devastated me. That just stopped my mind. That was literally coming to meet the wise man on the mountain and him actually answering <laughs> your question. One of the Kero praying to the mountains and they, they speak their prayers out loud. And in, not only that, but they put their prayers into physical objects. They may put them into stones, but the traditional way is with coca leaves. So they both chew coca leaves, but they see the coca plant as the sacred plant of the mountains. And it carries their prayers in very much the same way 
as tobacco carries the prayers for Native Americans in, uh, in North America. So coca leaves are just a whole other world of uh, medicine. This is uh, in the hills outside of Chinchero with the Sacred Valley in the background, Pum in the center, doing a despacho with Don Sebastian, who's a Keto shaman and another local shamaness uh, from the Chinchero village. And in the foreground are all of our mesas. We're with a group. I, I take groups down to Peru and uh, Puma leads those trips. Um, and so we all have our mesas uh, in, the, in the foreground there being blessed by the despacho and the, and the ceremony. This is grandfather's cave. Mm. Yeah, powerful. <laughs> Powerful and beautiful. This is Don Pedro. Don Pedro uh, is a wild man shaman, uh, lives in the outskirts of Cusco. Uh, and shamanism is very much like being an artist in the sense that uh, nobody does it the same way. Uh, there are certain principles, there are lots of principles, but you once it's it's a little bit like uh, I don't know wiring a house with electricity. Once you know how electricity works, you can wire that house any way you like. You can put fifty outlets in one room and two in another, and you can put in bright lights and dim lights and toasters and whatever. You get the idea. Once you realize that you can participate consciously and intentionally with those energies, then it's like what what are you called to? And as you can tell, I was called the stones, uh, stones and mountains. Yeah. Okay. So this is Machu Picchu, obviously a gorgeous place. The Inca Trail coming into Machu Picchu. This is Apu uh, the main spiritual mountain for the for the Caro and for many people in that region of Peru. They're generally thought to be twelve. Um, sacred mountains around Cusco, uh, each with their own teachings, each with their own energy, each with their own lineage. You would call on them for healing. You would call on them for teachings. You would call on them. They are different in the way that people are different. They have different abilities, different strengths. So after my first trip, to Peru or during my first trip in Peru, everybody heard that I was uh, totally in love with stones. I wanted to know everything I could find out about stones. And they said, well, if you wanna know about stones, you have to, you have to work with a medical yabar. He's the stone magician, <laughs> fantastic. Who's a medical yabar and where is he? A medico uh, is of Basque descent and his family um, settled quite close to the Keto. So as a child, he grew up playing with the Keto. He is a, a medico is an amazing man. He is a, a mystic, a poet, a teacher, a healer, uh, the most charming storyteller. Um, yeah. And um, so I found that a medico was doing a workshop in Arizona that summer. So I was very blessed that I met all of my long-term teachers basically on my very first trip and I've been back more than 30 times. Amerigo, uh, this was a week long in a uh, trip in uh, Arizona and uh, Amerigo was just, uh, I, I, I have no words. He, he, he moves energy, he moves the energy of the cosmos. He has many teachings about uh, how, how you can connect to that energy and bring it into your body and circulate it through healing. Uh, and of course, he taught me so much about stones. Um, yeah, one of my dear, dear friends. And Amerigo uh, is, uh, he, is uh, he lived in Europe for a long time. Uh, he speaks Italian fluently. I think he's a registered lawyer uh, in Italy. Uh, he, has, he has a thousand amazing stories. Um, 
and is a wonderful, generous teacher. Yeah. Um, and there is a, 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 I'll say something more about Amedico. Amedico's, mm, his gift to the world of his many gifts is the idea of sulka. Sulka is all of these things, when you start to put too many words on them, become smaller than what they really are. Sulka is like the energy of the cosmos. And as you might imagine, the energy of the cosmos is undomesticated. It's not hanging out at Starbucks. The sun is undomesticated energy. A mountain is undomesticated, untamed energy. And if you want to wake up in life, go connect with some Salka. So Amerigo's teachings are um, to expand the whole awareness and participation and uh, aliveness of bringing Salka into our lives, uh, into our hearts, into our imaginations, uh, and to remind us of that tremendous power that we walk in so casually day in and day out. When you start to see the universe as energy before you see it as stuff, I mean, we're trained, we're in a trance of Western culture to see things as solid, but we already know from quantum physics that there's nothing solid. It's mostly space. It's also totally energy. So whatever you want to connect with is, is energy. You know, we take a little tiny atom and make a huge explosion. That's what the potential is resting in everything, including the cardboard box that's holding up my iPad. Um, so your intent, your consciousness, or again, if you see everything as energy and consciousness, or another way to say it is awareness, because I'm not saying by consciousness that uh, my camera over there is busy thinking. I'm busy thinking, you're busy thinking. We're human beings, we're busy thinking. That's not consciousness. Or that is an aspect of consciousness. Or deductive reasoning is an aspect of consciousness. But the universe is aware and you can connect to that awareness as all of our ancestors knew. So. If you think of everything as energy and awareness, all you have to do is intend and believe without doubt. <laughs> Yenantin Masintin is complementary opposites. So it's, it's almost like, well, certainly masculine and feminine, certainly uh, yin and yang, that there is a pulse of energy through the universe, light and dark sun and moon um and it is being in balance you know it's being in a dynamic balance i remember in my early years people would say you need to get yourself in balance carl you know or nature is in balance and i i would always kind of like mm, okay if you say so <laughs> Uh, there was something, there was a disconnect. But the balance that is nature is a dynamic balance. In other words, it's, it's rainy and foggy today here. Yesterday it was sunny. We had thunderstorms last night. Um, in three months, it's going to be cold here. Nature is doing this always. It's always a dance. And why is it doing that dance? Why is probably the wrong word, but it's doing that to sustain life, to bring a dynamic balance. It's like Jeremy was saying, or I was using that example of, the, of a house that hasn't been lived in in six months. It's the energy is stagnant. All you have to do is get it to move. So that dance between the masculine and the feminine um, is what makes things live was saying everything is connected and everything is responsive uh, and if you know what you're doing like a medico and uh, Don Manuel Quispe 
you can get the clouds to move. Wonderful. We're out of time, everyone, but I, I'm uh, thrilled by this conversation. It's, it's so, so much fun and such a pleasure to see your photos, Carl, and to hear you talk and tell your stories. And I am uh, so grateful for all of you joining us today. And I'm looking forward to more conversations. We do this pretty much monthly uh, with different speakers, so uh, please uh, join us when you can. And uh, Carl, I'm looking forward to more, many more conversations with you in future as well. So thank you all. Thank you.